Good morning, everybody. Why don't you stand and worship with us this morning? sense his presence here today. God is so good to us. We want to welcome you and thank you for taking of your time to worship with us today. And those that are uh, watching online, thank you for giving of your time and just worship. God's got great things in store for us. If you are new, <coughs> excuse me, if you are new here today or you've changed your email address or your cell phone number or something, would you fill out the bottom of your bulletin and just put it in the offering plate? 
so we can stay in connection with you. We'd like to do that and just be able to contact you and let you know that we're thankful that you took time to worship with us today. Well, you may be seated. Anybody know what today is? BGMC Day. I like to hear those uh, barrels rattle. I heard them. Well, we're excited about BGMC, so I have to tell a little story. There became a little competition at our house this last month. So we usually have one barrel. We put all our change in it. We bring it on our Sunday. One of us will dump the barrel in the ladies or the men's, and the other one will put cash in. Just what we've done for a long time. Well, I saw a barrel sitting on our dresser, and it had dollar bills in it. I'm like, well, that's a little odd. So I said, well, why did you put dollar bills in the buddy barrel already? And he goes, well, I just had a few extra dollars, so I just thought I'd put them in there. And I went, huh, I think the guys will get ahead of us. So I grabbed my barrel, and I put mine coins in there and then I was doing laundry the other day and I found some dollar bills in there well and maybe a five <laughs> so I just grabbed it and thought well let's let's turn about fair play here so I put them in my buddy barrel then I felt a little guilty so I said um, I just want you to know that I found some dollar bills in the laundry and I just had a feeling that Anything that goes to the laundry goes to BGMC. He goes, thank you for that. Yes. I love the agreement there. And so I took them, and I didn't tell him how much it was, but I felt a little guilty, you know, at first. So, but it was more than a couple dollars. So I put it in mine. And so last night we were getting our barrels all ready for this morning, and he's pulling out his dollar bills, and I'm pulling out mine. Because the next day I found a couple more dollar bills in the laundry. <laughs> and uh, so I just said to him, he goes, how come you have more than me? And I said, well, really the laundry did it. It's all about the laundry. So I just say that to challenge you. Pastor and I just had fun. But make sure you're filling up your buddy barrels. And make sure that you're taking them the first Sunday of the month and you're putting them in the barrels in the back and all of that money goes to BGMC. If you were in Sunday school this morning, you heard from our missionary how they took the BGMC money that was given to them and they translated it in, into the New Testament, which was like a holy book for them where they're serving and were able to give that out because you and I gave. And you know, today... We have kids in our own congregation who are headed to missions. And everything that we give is going to further them along. Pastor's going to come, and this week, our kids are going to youth camp. And you know what? Amazing things happen at camp. We get called to be missionaries. We get called to be pastors. We get called to serve as a board or a mission at director or serve with youth. So we're expecting great things from our youth. And we've been praying over those camps this year and asking God to use everything that we give in missions to further along. And I'm wondering, we have Peter Olson as our missionary today, and he shared with us what he actually got to do with it. But I wonder what's going to happen with our teens that are headed to missions or headed to be a pastor, what they're going to do. But you know what? When we all give, the gospel gets out. And that's the key to it all. It isn't how much we give. It isn't what we give. It's that we give and that that money is used for the gospel. All I can say is amen to that. BGMC is a very important ministry and facet of ministry. Speed the light with the youth, BGMC with the kids, and then we as adults, on the first Sunday of the month, of course, we get our opportunity to uh, pitch our funds into the, uh, into the missions account, and we appreciate so very much your faithfulness and your giving. 
I would have to say, as far as the contact uh, contest is concerned, it's very unfair. I was going to take Peter out for lunch this afternoon, but now I can't because Buddy Barrow got my money. So, so, but uh, it's, it's a, a day. it's a worldly cause. But we appreciate you so much, your very, very much your faithfulness and giving. Today is a very special day that we have a special honor tribute to be given. And it's a week past, but we want to recognize it today. And that is we want to recognize Pastor Jeremy's birthday. He is 33 years old. We appreciate Pastor Jeremy and Joan and, and Haley. What an asset to us, and we just appreciate it. My wife says uh, we should remember that birthday last week. I said the card was on my desk, and uh, I was the one that slipped up. But today's a great day to do. He's going to be taking some kids to camp tomorrow. And how many kids that are here will be going to camp? Anyone kids that are going to camp tomorrow? We want to pray for, for them. I want to pray that God will bless them and God will minister to them. I know what camps are. I received the call of God on my life when I was a sophomore in high school at a camp in Hungry Horse, Montana. And so I know the importance of camp. I know the importance of our campground. It's now called the South Dakota Retreat Center. And on that note, they're in the process of renovating a lot of a lot of things upon the campground to make it more uh, conducive to the kids and the youth as well as uh, rental property to those that will be coming in having conv conventions at the retreat center. And if you would ever feel so led to give toward that need of the retreat center, the church has already given uh, an amount to the retreat center and others that were at district council also had the opportunity of giving. But it is a great, a great asset to our district. And so if you ever feel so led, uh, if you have any questions, call us. We'll give you the answers as much as we can. But they are looking forward to uh, some wholesale changes in the cafeteria, to the painting of some of the cabins, um, picnic tables, and everything that's going to really, really enhance our campground or our retreat center. So if you haven't ever have a need, that you are an urge to give toward that retreat center, please let us know. I know it will be greatly appreciated and will be greatly used. But let's stand together this morning. We're going to ask a special blessing and prayer over our youth as they, and our kids as they go to a high school camp, that God will be with them and that God will minister to them. And could we throw something else in on top of that prayer? And that is joy. This is, last, this is Joey's last Sunday with us. And it feels really weird, doesn't it? <laughs> really weird. He's been apart for so long, and we've grown to love and appreciate Joey. And let's remember Joey in prayer as he goes and leaves tomorrow for the service that God will be with him. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities that we have to serve you. God, we thank you for the vision of our district officials to build and to enhance upon the campground to make it a retreat center and then to continue that vision and and doing a lot of a lot of remodeling and renovating in that campground and god i pray that you would meet the needs that would be present financially because we have kids that are going there tomorrow and god i pray that it would be a special time that, Lord, it would be a time when you would pour out your spirit upon that camp. That, God, there would be young people who would feel the touch of God within their lives. And they would have that urgency to serve you in the fulfillment of a full-time ministry. Whether it be a missionary, evangelist, pastor, board member, Sunday school teacher, or even in an office job. That, God, they would fulfill that ministry. And I pray your blessings to be upon the kids as they would go. I pray that you would be with Jeremy and Elijah as they go. And 
I just ask God that you would grant them traveling mercies, that you would keep your hand upon them and bless them and let them be refreshed even though it will be a very taxing week, that they would still spiritually and physically somehow be refreshed. And then, Lord, we commit joy into your hands. God, it has been a privilege to have joy a part of our church and a part of our worship team, a part of the youth. And God, we ask your blessings to be upon Joey as he now takes another direction in his life. Lord, I pray that you would guide him and direct him, that you would give him wisdom, that you would give him a sensitivity to the leading of your Holy Spirit, and that he would follow in the ways that you have set before him. And then, Lord, we pray for John and Cindy. We know it's a difficult time, and there's their youngest going off in another direction in life and away from home. And I just pray that you'd just be with them, that you'd give them strength and comfort. God, we ask that you'd bless them. Lord, bless our camp, bless our kids, and bless our BGMC. And we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together as Pastor Jeremy and the worship team leads us this morning. With arms held high, Lord, I give my life, knowing I'm found in Christ, in your love forever. With all 
sing it out to the one. To the one who has rescued my soul. To the one who has welcomed me home. To the one who is Savior of all I see.
This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. All great of rapture now burst on my side angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy whispers of love come on sing it out this is my story this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my the voices this morning and this is my story and this is my song praising my savior all the day long and this is my story and this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. God, this morning we are aware of your faithfulness. Even though there may be times in our lives when we are faithless, you are always faithful. We thank you, Lord, that we can call upon the name of the Lord and to know that you are there. Your ears tuned to the cry of your people. That we are your children, we're the sheep of your pastors. 
that you have provided for us the means of salvation through the shedding of your blood, and that we know that because you gave your life, we now have life. And so, Lord, today we just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you have done for us. God, I thank you for the presence and the awareness of your spirit in this place. For we know the awesomeness of the presence of God is here. And we stand in awe in your presence. And we thank you and we worship you that today we once again have been given that honor to bask in the presence and in the holiness of God. And we worship you. Lord, we ask that you'd be mindful of needs that are represented within our church family. Maybe there are those that have needs, that they are in need of a touch physically or spiritually, emotionally, financially, whatever it might be that God, you would minister to the need, whatever it might be, and that you would touch them. And then, Lord, we especially remember Donna today as she will be undergoing her surgery tomorrow, that, God, you would be with her. I pray that you would guide the hands of the physician as you would just give them divine insight, wisdom, and direction, that the surgery would be successful, and then that you would grant to her a speedy recovery. Lord, just be with her. Lord, I pray for your peace. And I pray for your, for your presence to be experienced in this time. God, we are so grateful unto you that we can know that you are our Father and we are your children. And so, Lord, we come before you and we present these needs to you as a child with his Father. And God, we know you have heard us. And now we just believe you that you are going to do that which is according to your will and for your glory. May your blessings be upon the furtherance of this service. I pray your blessings to be upon our missionary speaker this morning. I just ask that you would anoint him, that he would be led by your spirit, and that, God, our hearts would be open, receptive, and that we would be able to appropriate that which is given, that your name might be glorified, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this morning. You may be seated. Well, it is good to have missionaries with us. It gives us kind of a little bit of an indication that um, we can take the church beyond the four walls of a building, and we can go even go into the entire world by our gifts and our giving. And in that note, I would like to remind you that at the end of the service, when you are leaving and you drop in your tithe and offering, into the basket in the and as you leave if you would desire to give a token of appreciation and love to our missionary Peter Olson I'm sure that it would be gladly appreciated we know that the missionaries have had a hard time through this pandemic season when so many things have been canceled but now things are beginning to open up a little more but if you would desire to give we want to encourage you to give those online if you had desire to give a gift to Peter, just drop a, a, a tithe into the church, whether it be by online or by smart, smartphone or by the Tithely app, whatever it might be, you can give to Peter in this way. But we want to encourage you, let's honor those whom honor is due. And it's good to have with us Peter Olson. I found out this morning that he is from North Dakota. The only thing that is somewhat regretful, he's from Fargo, <laughs> home of the bison. Can you imagine yeah. that? <laughs> uh, we got one of our young people going to um, USD, home of the coyotes. So I guess we're spreading all around, and God loves all of us anyway. But it is good to have Peter with us, and we're looking forward to this time. We had a great experience with him sharing with us in Sunday school and, and just to see the openness and the anticipation within his heart. So we're going to ask Peter if you come and just share with us your word. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. 
so appreciate you you guys here this morning. I was kind of hoping they'd get by without a mention of my alma mater. See, I just upped it there. I actually won the NSU. I'm sorry if that I can repent later. Is it is there like a designated spot for this one? But um, yeah, we just so appreciate you guys having me. I, I'm so used to saying us. Typically, my family gets to travel with me. They couldn't this weekend, uh, but they send their love, their greetings. And uh, yeah, it's just so good to worship together. Amen. I mean, we welcome you guys online. We love you. And I love you guys here with me in the space that we get to to do that together, corporately face-to-face in, in acknowledging the Lord in our midst and connecting with Him, honoring Him and worshiping Him. And so I want to mention one thing real quick. Uh, Kathy mentioned BGMC. I brought one of what she was referring to up here with me. There's also one on the table. I actually brought two back, I found out. Um, but these are in Julie's, uh, it's called. I can tell you what they are and, and the story about them later. Just stop by the table. I'd love to talk to any of you afterwards. Uh, I'll be here as long as Pastor lets me. Um, I guess we're going to go fast this afternoon, though, so maybe we can be here forever. Um, but yeah, so let me tell you a bit about us. So the picture on the screen, obviously the cute parts of my family are all on the screen, so you can just look at that one. Uh, but my family, it's myself, Peter, Kayla, my wife, and then our three kids now, the team has grown over the years. Uh, so Ariel is just turned six. Uh, I, I have to start practicing that now. It's only two weeks old, that fact. So she turned six. Uh, Judah is three years old. And Everett is eight months now. So there you see, uh, he's got the squishy baby face. Like, it's awesome. He's a little older than the picture. The picture's like, I don't know, like eight weeks or something. But uh, yeah, so they, they send their greetings, but let me tell you just briefly about ourselves. Um, so who we are, like who, who are these people uh, being represented in the photo and, and, and in front of you right now? So Kayla, my wife, uh, she grew up in Bismarck, so North Dakota, but not the, the, that evil city, I guess. Um, so north of Bismarck in a little town, about 1,500 people. I used to tease her that there was only one stoplight in town. She corrected me finally enough times I, I now remember there are zero Stoplights. Apparently, my brain thought one was the minimum, so it's not it's zero. Uh, but she grew up there. Uh, but she was about ten years old when she was in kids' church, uh, sitting in, in kids' church that morning. And there was a missionary that came. She said, uh, and she doesn't remember the name or where they were from, or even if it was a guy or a girl. She doesn't remember anything other than the fact God spoke to her, spoke to her heart. Kayla, would you go? Because I'm calling you to the nations. And so from that moment, she just began walking that out in obedience and, and was, was actually went to Illinois to go to a ministry training school for three years. And God asked her to move to Fargo, a you know, missionary to Fargo, uh, after that point. And she was really confused because she was preparing to go overseas. She needed somewhere to, to get a job and, and, and do support raising and all that before going. So she's praying and God says, go to Fargo. Well, lo and behold, who was in Fargo? You know, I was. Thank you, the Lord, for speaking powerfully. Um, So I had actually grown up in Fargo, and I went to that school, and I got my degree actually in mechanical engineering. So my my career started as an engineer. That's that's my story. Uh, But I was in college partway through when God actually had a moment with me that really started shaping the direction of my life from that moment forward. And, and the moment was this. It was a worship service much like this one. And if this room was that one, I would have been sitting about the fifth row back, second chair in on that side. And we got to the end of a chorus that morning. And my brain recognized the reality that I had just sang through the entire song, chorus, verse, verse, chorus, whatever it was. And 100% of the time, my brain had been disconnected from what I was actually doing. I was thinking about the football game, yet I had the song so memorized, the routine of that worship service so memorized, I realized that I didn't miss a note, didn't miss a word, and my brain was completely disconnected. And that realization really bothered me, thankfully, praise God, that I I came to this recognition that, okay, is there something real to this relationship I say I have with the Lord, or is there not? Because is this just something that I've so memorized that I just do it because it's what I do? Or is there something real? And so that, that moment, I started praying one thing. And it became, for me, the next six months of my life was praying one thing. It was, God, is there more? 
And that is a prayer that God likes answering. <laughs> and he drew me through that process for six months, but he answered it and he began shaping my life after that. And uh, one thing he didn't mention about NDSU is the, the college ministry there I got to be a part of, Chi Alpha, uh, just really uh, being, being a part of that and, and developing uh, my, my faith and my walk and my prayer life on, on all new deeper levels and, and just seeing God transform who, my, who I was. So I get to the end of college, graduate, and I had this recognition. It's like, God, I never actually asked your advice or your opinion even on what I did with my life. I just thought engineering looked cool and I could do that. Uh, so I was. So I was like, okay, maybe, maybe we should check in. Um, so before I head off into my career, Lord, uh, did you have an opinion on this one? And I found myself praying through like, Lord, I will walk away from this and I'll do whatever it is you're asking me. I just want to know what that is. And is it ministry? Is it even ministry not even in the U.S.? Is it, are you asking me to do something different than what I've been planning on? And got to this, this, this point of saying, okay, missions, I will, I'll do that, God. Are you asking me to leave the shores of the only nation I've ever known and to go and serve you where you are working in other places, where, they, where you need hands and feet to touch the soil and to be a part of what you, God, are doing? I'm like, God, are you asking? Because I think I'm willing. I think I'd do that. And he said, not yet. <laughs> so that's how I ended up staying in Fargo, actually. I actually, you know, took a job, started working for a firm in West Fargo. And Kayla moved to town, and we met. Within 20 words of knowing my name, she had turned around and asked her sister if they could leave the event they were at. Uh, so that was my high, like, taking off, like... The Lord, the Lord had to blind her later, I guess. But so we eventually, you know, started dating um, and, and got married, and, and the Lord brought that all together. It's a much longer story, um, but suffice to say, we got to do ministry in Fargo for a few years, and the Lord brought us to a point now, as a married couple, of bringing us to a to a point where He said, "Okay, now it's time. Now it's time." Kayla, since the time she was ten, uh, me since college, you know, now it's time. I'm sending you out resign the positions, head out, we're, we're going overseas. And so that was 2013, we got to start serving in East Africa. And I told a bit about that location earlier. Uh, but after our first term over there in East Africa, we, we had a transition, we got to join a new team and got sent off to Ethiopia, where we get to serve now. So I, I wanted to bring you up to speed on that, what we do now. And so here is a map. I did not try and trick you, it is the red country. Uh, I should try that one time, like stick it in Zaire or something, and then just totally mess with you guys. But it's the red one, so that's Ethiopia. Uh, so what we border, uh, we border to, oh, that's outer space, actually. So there we go. Uh, so we border on the left there, uh, Sudan's, nor um, Sudan, South Sudan, just north of us, Eritrea. Uh, Somalia is our eastern border. And actually, it's only like 100, 150 miles from the northern border of Ethiopia up across the Gulf into Saudi Arabia. Uh, Mecca is not very far, really. And so that's where we get to live. If you recognize some of those countries, it's a, it's a place with a lot of opportunity, right? And, and so if I say Ethiopia, if I even just say Africa, you probably have a picture, right? If you saw the Lion King, or apparently there's a new Lion King, you've seen like, you got a picture of Africa, right? So if you put that next one up, maybe this is what you're, you're thinking of here. Well, not that one, actually. Um, but yeah. If you go to the next one, let's try this one. I kind of like, oh, no. Yeah, so is the, the coffee one. If we go back, back to the coffee one, that'd be cool. So we've got, we've got a, a, a nation that is actually the second most populous nation on the African continent. And I think there's a picture before this one uh, with some po coffee beans. But it's a nation that's actually the birthplace of coffee. If any of you had coffee this morning, no one? A few of you? Okay. Yes. Good. All right. I love churches where I walk in that are baked goods and coffee. You guys check both boxes. This is good. Um, actually, I was at a church a few weeks ago where they, <laughs> I teased them for this because they had like fluorescent frosting, like it was like fluorescent blue frosting cupcakes sitting out in the lobby and donuts as well. It was like fluorescent green donuts, like just all this frosting all over it. And the kids are just running up and grabbing them and going to kids' church. 
And so I was like, I don't think your kid's pastor was a part of the conversation of should we hand like sugar laden donuts and cupcakes to kids and then send them to kids church. Like they just, I don't know, maybe, maybe they had a, like a, a special board meeting where the kids all came as representatives. That's what they voted on. Um, but yeah, so birthplace of coffee, it's awesome. And it's, there's, there are vast stretches of Ethiopia that are very rural. It's very like, if you picture the Lion King movies, that's, that's what you're seeing. Uh, but there are also parts like, like the city. If you want to put the picture of the city back up there, uh, this is the city where we get to serve at. It, that's maybe not what you're picturing as, as Ethiopia, right? It's a city of somewhere between 3 and 10 million people. Census statistics are kind of fuzzy. Um, but there's a lot of people. I mean, if you take South Dakota and you add all of North Dakota and all of Wyoming and all of Montana and cram it into one city, there's still more people in that city. It's a lot of people. And so it's called the political center of Africa, or the political capital of Africa. So the, the capital city of Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, it's, it's a city with a lot of things happening in it. And a lot of things that happen in that city, in the halls of those offices and, and ministries and, and uh, organizations headquartered there, ripple across the entire continent. And so here's what was happening uh, in this city. Because this is the city we were sent to four years ago. And here's why. So our partners, anywhere Assemblies of God World Missions go, we, we either plant the church where it exists or it does not exist, or we go to partner with the church, strengthen the church, and go with the church where it does exist. And so in Ethiopia, we're going to partner and to strengthen and, and walk alongside and go with our partners there, the Ethiopian Assemblies of God. And so here's what they were watching for about 20 years. You know, if you remember back, my six months of prayer, like one thing, they had 20, 25 years of one prayer. And it was this. They were watching this city, the city of Addis Ababa, and they were watching a few things happening. They were watching uh, the headquarters of all these international organizations moving in. You know, the African Union, if you picture the UN of Africa, African Union headquarters are there. Uh, you have... All the elite universities of the nation are there. You have the, the World Bank has their headquarters there. You got all these things, and, and you start to get the snowball effect where because all these people are here, everyone else who wants to have a continental-wide reach or, or impact, they, they move in because everyone they're working with, they're already there. And so they're watching this developing in the city, and they're also watching a couple of other things. They're watching people who had fled Ethiopia back in the 70s and 80s, if you're aware of your history, um, there was a Marxist regi regime that had come through, and tens of thousands of people had fled. Well, a lot of them or, or their kids had grown up in places in Europe, other Western societies, and they were starting to move back. And they're watching this stream of people coming back in who are no longer completely Ethiopian in culture or language, and mixing with all these thousands and thousands of diplomats and, and NGO workers and organization people who are we're all coming into their city and they realize we have churches who are connecting with our native language speaking Ethiopians well, but we have nothing that is connecting with this whole ballooning population of people in our city. And so they start praying, God send us someone to plant, to come alongside us, to help us plant a church that will meet this growing opportunity. And so we got to, to come in and be a part of that. And so. If you scroll ahead, uh, we've got a picture from the church. Yeah, we, we can camp on this one. Uh, that's all right. Uh, and so here is, we got to launch Easter Sunday 2017. So I can only think of one other better day, Pastor, to launch a church, uh, Pentecost Sunday. But if you're not going to launch a Pentecost Sunday, Easter Sunday, why not? So we launched on Easter Sunday 2017. And this is a celebration I wanted to show you because this Easter Sunday, a couple of things happened. Uh, one, the church turned four years old. So, hey, cool. Four year, we have like birthday parties every year still. I'm not sure how long that'll be a thing. But we also had five baptisms on Easter Sunday. And so this is a guy who got baptized on Easter Sunday. Praise God. And so, and another thing, I don't know if we still have that, that photo up there, but the, it's uh, from the next classes. We had... Just a few weeks back, this is like three or four weeks back, um, not this one, but 
uh, we, <laughs> sorry, uh, but we had, uh, we had 40 people, guys, 40 people from the church showed up on a Saturday for four hours to come be a part of a leadership class. Because these, are, these were people who were not just saying, hey, I want to follow Christ for myself. But these were 40 individuals who were saying, I'm ready to take that next step. I'm engaged. I'm bought in. I want to be equipped and go forth to be a leader, a disciple-making disciple. And so these people showed up, and they invested four hours of their Saturday. Oh, here they are. Yeah, packing into this room. And, and just investing. And, and these are the kinds of people we get to work with and see God working in their lives. And there's people like Johannes, who was, he spent some time in the U.S. He, he, he actually had a, a really nice job on Wall Street. Then 2008 happened. He lost everything. But ends up back in Ethiopia at a, in a position appointed by the prime minister, actually. And he's walking the streets of Addis Ababa saying, there's just something missing in my life. Like, it's just in emptiness. This is his testimony as he told it to the church recently. And, and he, so he's talking to his cousin, who happened to be a part of our church at the time. And his cousin's like, hey, you need Jesus. That's what you need. Like, you got to come to church. And he's like, no, no, I've tried that. It's like, no, I'm, that's not it. And his cousin's like, no, really, you, you need to come to church. Like, so tell you what, I found a church. I think they get you. That's, that was his phrase, actually. I, they, they get you. I think they get you. And, uh, and you'll, you'll connect with them, like, just come on. So he walks in the lobby that first Sunday, and he later told us, he walked in and just felt like, I'm home. I came home. And we got to walk that road of, of finding Jesus, getting baptized, and uh, it was a great one. Or, or someone like Lydia, who, you know, self-proclaimed atheist, who got invited to small group. Enough times she actually showed up. And she said, it was a little weird. I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay or not. Like it, but there was something about it that made me come back and then come back again and again. And then she got baptized. And we've seen God do amazing things in her life. And, and uh, it's just great to see what the Lord is doing and to be a part of what God is doing, right? So I think we've got another picture on top of a hill. If you want to put that one up for me. Let me tell you about this picture real quick. So this is a picture taken on top of a hill outside of Wasa, Ethiopia, right after a prayer meeting we had had. And you're looking south, which is significant for two reasons. Let me tell you why. If you look to the left of this picture, that means you're looking off into the east, which means just over that hill, just up on the upper left side hand side, that horizon is Somalia. Just right there. That horizon right there is Somalia, which means you're looking off into a place where there are today very few people that know who Jesus is. And very few opportunities for those people living over there to meet Jesus. And it also means that if you look across that lake over to the right-hand side of this very photo, you're looking off into parts of, of southwestern Ethiopia where there are many tribal religions and pockets of places where they've never even encountered the name of Jesus. It's not like within Islam where there's a deception wrapped around who he is, but there's just a complete lack of knowledge that he exists. And one of these places right over there, there's a tribe called the Bonga region. The, the Bonga people live there. And uh, it's actually known for really good coffee. I had a, a bag of coffee that I just brewed yesterday morning for this group that was grown in the Bonga region of coffee. It was really good stuff. And I drank some on my way down here yesterday, actually. Uh, but it's also known as one of these places where very few people know who Jesus is. But it's also known for a third thing. And it's something we get to celebrate right now. Because the third thing is that it's also the very region where this church we got to help plant sent its first missionary to four years ago. And for the last four years now, he's been planting house churches in that, in that region where he actually grew up. So we got to be a part of sending him back and seeing a mission sending movement now starting to get some root in Ethiopia where Ethiopian churches are now sending people out as missionaries. Not something that's real common in, in the Ethiopian context right now. So we're getting to see that happen and praise God. Uh, and so in the last four years, we've actually seen four missionaries now sent out in four years which is, I think that's pretty good. Like, I, I suppose we could do better, but four and four years, like, I, I feel like God's doing something there and we are excited about it. And so we're, we're not gonna stop there though, right? Because we keep following. 
we keep following what God puts in front of us. We keep following what he asks of us. We follow him into the opportunities he places before us, right? And I want to invite you guys to do that with us. To follow Jesus. That's, that's what it's about. That's what we have to do, right? And it's not about following Jesus to the point of what is convenient. The point is not following Jesus even to the point of um, your intellectual understanding or to the point of your conscience or to, to the point of what is acceptable. The point is following Jesus to the point of what is obedient, right? And here's the thing with that. Like, I feel like we could probably, you and I, sit down at a table, have a conversation with some, some good coffee and and quickly find some agreement on a whole lot of things. Like we're probably not going to sit down and read Matthew chapter 8 and the Great Commission and have an argument over the call of the church to go into the, all the world and make disciples. We're, we're probably going to agree on that pretty quick, right? And we're probably going to have some qu- pretty quick agreement on the reality that there are places on earth where people do not know the name of Christ. There are even places, geographical regions on earth right now where no Christian soul has ever stepped foot and breathed the air. Not even one time, not in 2,000 years. That those places still exist. And we can agree on that. We can, we can even read Romans chapter 10 and, and that how will they be saved unless they believe? And how can they believe unless someone tells them? And how can someone tell them unless they go? And how can they go unless they're sent? We can read this and we can say, yes, like this is... This is the call of what the church should respond to, right? And we can come to agreement on that and say that, yes, the church needs to respond. And someone needs to go. And someone needs to learn the language. And someone needs to go through those things. And someone needs to transition their family. And someone needs to cross borders and cross cultures and and, and be persecuted if that's what it comes to, to endure hardship, to struggle Someone needs to do this because if this is the call of the church, then somebody needs to do that. But somebody is safer to talk about because somebody is not a name. And that's what it comes to because for, for intellectual agreement to become reality that the church is walking out, somebody can't stay in the ephemeral, undefined boundaries of somebody, right? Right? Somebody has to become somebody's son and somebody's daughter, someone's parent or grandparent. Somebody has to move from being somebody to being a name. Somebody has to actually be willing to to move, to go, to learn. Someone has to actually be willing to send. Someone has to actually be willing to get up and walk across the street to knock on the door of a neighbor. Someone has to actually be willing to stop and have a conversation the Holy Spirit is speaking to you to have as you're going through the checkout line at Walmart or to talk to the person next to you at the Cenex pump. Someone has to actually go across the hallway to their coworker. Someone has to actually talk to their family members. Someone has to actually walk out what God calls us to walk out is the body of Christ. And someone has to, yes, go to some places where there is not currently someone to do that. But who is going to be someone? And that's my, my invitation. That's my challenge. That's, that's because if we are the body of Christ, the so 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it appears elsewhere as well, but if we are the body of Christ, then here's the truth, that either you are called you are called or none of us are because i see nowhere a picture of god calling my finger to detach itself from the rest of my body and go across the room like that'd be freaky and so if he's calling the body of christ to respond to the great commission to respond to his invitation to walk out the gospel here there and everywhere And if he's calling the body of Christ to do that, he's calling you or he's calling none of us because we move together. We are the body of Christ. And your your part of that may not look like mine. My part may not look like yours, but what part is he asking of you? And are we willing to follow him 
not to the point of our convenience or our comfort, but to obedience. And that's, I'm not assuming anything, but that's, that's my invitation. That's what I'm asking. And, um, and just in the last few minutes we got to, to share, um, I want to ask you to turn to Mark chapter 2 with me. Because in that, it's really powerful to let the Holy Spirit speak to us through the Word of God, right? And so let me just share a couple of things with you. Mark chapter 2. So, yeah, there we go. I'm going to be picking up just right there in verse 1. I'm reading the first five verses in Mark chapter 2 here. If you want to read along with me. So when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. And soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. And while he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, which that's pretty cool. And so they couldn't bring him in to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. You can, Pastor, I did not want to illustrate this by like having someone actually chop through the ceiling here. Um, but then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. All right? And seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Okay, so let me give you some real quick context here. Uh, This story is taking place in Capernaum, which is significant for a couple of reasons, all right? Capernaum, first of all, Jesus is not a new figure here, okay? If you you know your New Testament, Jesus uh, is often found coming into or leaving from Capernaum. It's kind of like his headquarters. He didn't have a condo there. He stayed with other people. Uh, Probably, a lot of scholars agree, was probably Peter, the apostle Peter his disciples. So this quite likely is happening at Peter's house. You can picture it as the roof is getting torn through, right? And so he's been here before though. Another thing, Capernaum is small, main city in this time, but that does not mean large. It was likely, scholars estimate, at least under 2,000 people. All right, so not Brookings, uh, like, like small, like where my wife grew up. And so if any of you have lived in a small town, let me tell you something about it. If, if something like Jesus comes in, like Mark chapter 1, has a prayer meeting, healings happen, if that happens in a small town, a week later, there is no one who does not know what happened. There's nobody in Capernaum who has not heard who Jesus is and what happened at least the last time he was in Capernaum. And so here's what's what's we have to be looking at as this story comes to us everybody in this city and the surrounding area we find out they know who Jesus is they know what happened last time and they start showing up and so here's my question for you what do you do if you're in Capernaum you you've heard who Jesus is and you hear he's back you hear he's in that house across town what do you do because I think we have a couple of opportunities to find ourselves in this story this morning. One is, what if you are paralyzed? And it doesn't have to be physical paralysis, right? Could, could we expand that for a moment? Because we're living in an era where fear has paralyzed so much of so many people's lives. Confusion. What do I believe? What do I not believe? Who do I listen to? Who do I not? Like paralysis of confusion and fear and doubt and and anguish and anxiety and all these things like how many of us know someone at least who has become in part paralyzed by so many things happening in the world right now and people who are paralyzed by by physical things happening to them societal things happening to them people who are paralyzed and maybe that's you and 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 if you're finding yourself in that place and you hear jesus is here like what what do you do and what do you do if you know someone? Because if, if, you, if you are paralyzed, just imagine, I want to illustrate for you that, that you had to overcome so much to get to where Jesus was. You had to be willing in that society, that day and age, to come out of where you were, to be carried down a sidewalk or road, to be carried up to a crowd, where everyone in that crowd would have believed two things, one of two things about your condition. Either A, God had simply decided to curse you, or B, the only other reason you would have been paralyzed was there was some terrible sin in your life you were unrepentant of, 
And this was the consequence of it. And so you're being carried up as either God cursed you or you've done something and as a result, God has cursed you. This is what the crowd is believing of you for you to expose what is going on in your life. But you have to expose that to be carried to the house where the answer is. And being willing to do that. And sometimes are we willing to enlist the help of others to come alongside us, to carry us to Christ, to bring ourselves, to reorientate our hearts and our minds and our attentions on the only answer that can actually answer anything. And to come to Christ and let him speak to our hearts. And so I don't know if that's speaking to someone this morning, but if that's you, I want to speak to you. Come to him. He did not leave this paralyzed man paralyzed. He didn't. He forgave him. And then if you continue reading the verses, he heals him and the guy walks out carrying his bed. Praise God. Like, he's not going to leave you. And so come to him. And, and we, could, we could talk about the crowd. There's an aside on the crowd that I don't want to get into, but... Knows the crowd had packed the house so much. These were the people who, they'd heard who Jesus was, and they'd pack the house to hear and parse his words and see if they agreed with him. And so much so that the people, the, the broken people, the people with needs, the people seeking the Lord could not even find their way through the throng to get inside. May we not be that church is so consumed with being there that we leave outside the ones we should have brought there to the presence of God. But I want to major here last few minutes on those four individuals. Because this is the call, the invitation, I think everyone in this room needs to recognize that you and I, we have. And so it's, it's this question, what do you do if you know someone who's paralyzed in some form or fashion in their life, and you know who Christ is. Because I want to read verse 4. Or, sorry, verse 5 for you again. And verse 5 says this. It says, Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. Those first three words. Seeing their faith. Seeing their faith. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, all right, but I, I know enough to read people who are really smart and know these things, and I check this out for you, all right? The pronoun there in the Greek, in the original, is plural. Seeing their faith. He's, he's speaking of some group of plural individuals whose faith Jesus responds to and then forgiving and healing this man. And so uh, I'm, I am okay at math, and I can count one is not plural, right? And so one paralyzed man, a plural, does not make. So I don't want to discount the faith that, that he was exercising, but at least in part, we have to be including here who? The four who carried him, seeing their faith in response to the faith of those who did not need and did not have their need met, but went out, they knew someone, they walked into someone else's life, they engaged someone else, they, they played that part, carried that burden, carried him to a crowd, carried him up on a building, chopped through a ceiling, which just because the guy gets healed later does not mean someone still doesn't have to pay for a new ceiling, right? So just throwing that out there. Um, I think that's funny. <laughs> like, it's Peter's house. He's probably going to bring it back later. But... Someone still has to be willing to do all of these things to bring him to the moment where Jesus now meets him. And it's their faith, their faith, their confidence of saying, if I bring you to Jesus, Jesus is the answer you need. It's my friend in Ethiopia saying, cousin, you got to come to Jesus. That's what you're looking for over and over until he does. And that's our opportunity that your willingness to pray, that your willingness to go, your willingness to speak, your willingness to love, your willingness to forgive, your willingness to engage, your willingness to ob ultimately obey what the Holy Spirit is asking of you becomes a part of the story of what God does in other people's lives. 
This is our invitation. This is our opportunity as the body of Christ to see God through our obedience, our faith, change other people's stories. And we get to be a part of that and we get to do that. And so I just want to leave that with you, that encouragement that, that this is our invitation. And you get to do that. And, and I don't know what the part specifically is that God has asked you to engage with, with your life that he's given you. But again, either you are called and there is a place and a part for you, a role that God is calling you into, or there is not for any of us. Because it's together as the body of Christ that we do this. And so with that, can I pray for you guys? And then, and Pastor, if you want to come back up. Father, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for this moment. I want to thank you for, for what we get to do in response to what you have done that was not in response to us first turning to you, Lord, but it was you before we ever thought of you, before we ever thought to look for you, before we ever had our heart's affection turned towards you at all. Lord, but God, we love because you first loved us. And so, Father, I thank you for that. Then response to who you are, we have this opportunity to respond to you. And Lord, I want to pray for anyone who's hearing my voice right now, who who that is their moment. Maybe they are feeling paralyzed right now by any number of things, including their, their place in life, their, the, the, if there is sin in their life or there's a separation from you they are feeling. Well, I just pray right now that as they turn their hearts to you, as they reorient, reorient their, their attention and their hearts to you, that you would meet them in this moment. As they surrender their life to you and surrender the pride that they have to lay down to walk that road or, or the, the pride that they have to lay down to call others alongside them, to pray with them and to walk this out with them, Lord, whatever it is they have to walk away from and lay down as you speak to them, Lord, that they would do it and find you speaking life and breathing hope into their hearts right now. And Lord, I pray that for those of us who know you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak into our hearts and into our minds. Lord, you have created us. You know how to speak in ways that we can understand it is you. And so, Lord, I pray for hearts in us that are willing to listen, hearts that are willing to pay attention, hearts that are willing to follow, hearts that are willing to follow not to the edge of our convenience or not to the edge of our comfort or not to the edge of any of those things, but to obedience. What is it you have called us to obey you in? That we might see you lifted up, that we might see you glorified, that we might see you elevated, that we might see people coming to know you here in Brookings, South Dakota. That we might see you being lifted high, Lord, and people coming to know you in lives and cities and nations even transformed across this globe. Lord, because that's how great you are. So Lord, I pray a blessing on everyone here that we would follow you and that we would see what you are doing come to pass, that we would see the dreams you're putting in our hearts enacted in the world around us. And as we focus on you and glorify you, Lord, that you would be glorified. Thank you, Peter, for the word. What a challenge to each one of our lives to know that we've been called. We don't wait for someone else to do it because if we wait for someone else, guess who does it? Nobody. And so we call and we yield ourselves to the call and to obedience in God's purpose for our lives. This morning as we close, we're going to close by a word of prayer for Peter. We just want God to be with them. God knows what is before them. They know what lies before them to a certain extent, and we're just going to pray that God will be with them. And so let's stand together this same morning, shall we, as we say a special word of prayer for Peter, and then we're going to ask Pastor Jeremy if he would close in a course and then close the service in prayer. Father, thank you for the word. God, your word that was so indelibly impressed upon our hearts today is to think that we have been called. So many times you wait 
waiting for us to yield ourselves and to say, yes, Lord, speak. Your servant heareth. And I thank you for the word that Peter has given us today, and I just pray that we would take it now to heart because the message today doesn't end here. It starts. It's a new beginning because now we take the word which was spoken and we begin to act upon it and to be a stretcher bearer to bring that one to salvation, to bring that one to Christ, to bring that one who is suffering some type of paralysis within their lives, that they might walk in freedom and liberty because their sins have been forgiven. God, we ask that you would be with Peter and his family. We thank you for the call that you have placed upon their lives, and I pray, Lord, that you would bless them. I pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon him and that you would just lead him and guide him as he leads his family, and Lord, that you would meet their every need that they might have in their needs personally or in their needs ministerially. God, meet their needs. Touch their lives. Touch into resources that they have no knowledge of, that the resources would be made known and would come forth in helping and supplying the needs. Lord, we speak healing. We speak health. We speak faith into their lives as they continue to follow you. And then, God, we pray for a fruitful ministry, that there would be lives that would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because of their faithfulness and because of their willingness to say, yes, Lord, we'll go. And because of that, many will be saved. God bless him now. Bless his family. Minister to them. And Lord, bless us as a body of believers as we walk this message out in our lives, that we would do our part in bringing someone to Christ in our lives, we pray. We ask it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Jerry, if you... for loving us, Lord. Yes, Jesus, thank you. We worship you. We adore you. Lord, now let us leave this place and go out and show the love that you've showed us to other people. God, give us opportunities to share our faith with other people. That's what you've called us to do, Lord. So give us opportunity to do it. We thank you for it. In your name, amen. God bless you as you go.
Don't forget various ways of giving. You can give today as our ushers will have baskets as you're leaving. Don't forget to sow into the ministry of pastor, missionary, Peter Olson, as you leave today. But also you can give online through the Tidely app, all the different things. So make sure to do that. We thank you. We love you guys. Have a great week.